Hey, this is Joe Pierce, photographer and filmmaker, calling in from the Deus 9 foot and single competition here in Changu, Indonesia. Keep up the great work, Kyle. Thank you. Joe, thank you for sending that in, my man. I know you sent that a while ago, so I'm guessing that the competition is over and you have returned from Bali. Nonetheless, thank you for sending it. And if any of you want to send me some little voice memos, record it on your phone using the Voice Memos app. Let me know who you are and where you are in this moment right now. Because all of you who are listening to my voice are somewhere right now. And where is that? It doesn't need to be Bali. It could be an office. You could be walking your dog. You could be... I'd like to imagine you right now riding a stallion on the beach with a beer in your hand, gazing at the future. And I want you to pull your phone out and tell me exactly that. You can even lie and tell me where you are. I don't even care. Just give me some details. I love getting these. Email them to info at kyle.surf. I'll leave the link below this episode. I'm coming to you from Santa Cruz, California after a week of surfing some of the best big waves of my life. Mavericks was as good as it gets day before yesterday and yesterday morning. Groomed northeast winds, 25, 30 foot waves, and perfect, absolutely ruler edge, beautiful waves. And some of the goofy foot guys, Nick Von Rupp, who I just did a podcast with, got one of the best, if not probably the best, barrel on a left that anyone has ever gotten out there. It's so exciting to be out there with these guys that don't just ride the waves. They don't just ride down the face of the wave. They knife it, and they're trying to get barreled on 25-foot waves. It's fucking unbelievable. Um, I have a sore neck. I caught some fun waves. I had a real nice wipeout. Uh, first thing yesterday morning, my first wave of the day, I was barely awake. I was out there at 7 a.m. I decided to go on one and I just, I didn't paddle hard enough. I should have, when I thought it was time to stand up, I should have paddled three more times, then stood up, but I stood up and then I was at the top of the wave and it was kind of like looking down over a vert ramp. And I knew that there was, I knew there was a ledge that I was like, okay, I'm going to try and make it down. I jumped over the ledge and then I fell forward, like on my front foot, tippy toes, splat. But uh, wipeouts are good. Comedians say that bombing on stage is the best thing that can happen to comedians because um, it teaches you to learn. And I think that falling on a big wave is one of the best things that can happen as long as you learn. And it sucks. I don't I don't want that to happen again. Um. I think it was because I drank coffee in the morning and I didn't poop. Honestly, you need a good morning poop before you go surfing. Didn't happen to me. And that story about my wipeout is a perfect segue for me to talk about our first sponsor, Mudwater. Mudwater is a chai mushroom blend that I love and it's helping to wean me off of coffee. Okay, I love coffee, but if I drink too much, I skits out. I try and do 50 things in a morning, and I only get halfway done with all of them. I'm like, ooh, I'm going to write some jokes. Ooh, I'm going to de-wax my surfboards. I'm going to build a second story on my house this morning. And, of course, I don't get any of those things completely done. And one thing I'm working on right now is getting less things done, but the things that I choose to do, I want to get them 100% done. Okay. And with mud water, it's got these groovy mushroom blends that make you smarter. It's got a little bit of caffeine, and it's a great replacement for coffee. I use it with Santa Cruz Medicinals CBD Coconut Oil. These guys also sponsor the podcast. They're the only two sponsors that I'm bringing on the show, and that's because I use both these products. I have been using them for the last year. And I'm friends with both of the owners, so I can vouch for them as people. Not just the products, I can vouch for the people that run these companies. So, right now I'm drinking Mud Water and Santa Cruz Medicinals CBD Cocoa Oil. I've also been lathering that shit on my neck, given that I'm a little sore after that wipeout. Um, They're both great products. Um, 
And it's crazy to think about how addicted we are to coffee. Like, we're all addicted to a drug. Straight up. Try and go to work tomorrow and not drink coffee. You're going to suffer. But if you use this mud water and Santa Cruz Medicinals CBD cocoa oil blend, I think it's a great way to do it, and it's way healthier. It's a lifestyle. I want to slow down. I don't. It, life moves fast, and all the old people say, "Oh man, just enjoy it because it goes fast." So why are we trying? Why are we using drugs that just speed life up? Okay, I want to slow it down. I want to think more deeply about things. I did a podcast with Matt Taibbi a couple weeks ago. It's one of my favorites ever. And he was talking about how Hunter S. Thompson, when he was uh, writing on the campaign trail, he said you could tell that he was on amphetamines because he would write these really long passages. And what Taibbi was saying, and Taibbi is a Rolling Stone writer, one of the best writers in the world. He said the problem with amphetamines, because he used to do drugs, and he talks about it, he says, is it shuts off the self-critic. It just makes you think that you're awesome all the time. And... I think that the perfect balance is to have confidence in yourself, energy, and also be able to move slowly enough that you can have that self-critic and think about the world in a sober way, not be skitzed out on amphetamines or five cups of coffee, feeling like you need to shit your pants and then going on a bad wave at Mavericks and wiping out. Should have drank mud water yesterday morning. That was the problem. Should add some Santa Cruz Medicinal CBD. For those of you who donate to this podcast on Patreon, I totally get it if you want to stop donating. Um, know that if you want to keep donating, it's still going to be going directly into the podcast. It's going to go towards gas money for me to be driving around California getting these interviews for you. Um, it's going to go to the fees that I need to pay for Squarespace, for Libsyn, which is the podcasting um, podcast syndication site. There's a lot of costs attached to this stuff. Um, so know that your money, if you choose to continue to donate, will be going towards making this thing even better. Um, and if you want to stop, totally get it. Um, I will be adding a new feature to my site where you guys can buy um, mud water products, SC medicinal products, and um, books from authors that I've had on this um, show, all in packages at a reduced rate. So the first book that's going up, it's not live yet, is going to be um, uh, signed copies from Wallace J. Nichols, um, and his book is Blue Mind. I've had him him on the show a few times. So I'll let you know when all of that is up. My guest today is Ian Urbina. Ian Urbina is an investigative reporter based in Washington, D.C. His most recent series, The Outlaw Ocean, chronicles a diversity of crimes offshore, including the killing of stowaways, sea slavery, intentional dumping, illegal fishing, the stealing of ships, gun running, stranding of crews, and murder with impunity. He is reported from Africa, Asia, Europe, South America, and the Middle East, much of that time spent on fishing ships. He's a badass, he's the real deal, and I love this conversation. So, please welcome to the show, Ian Orbina. Kyle Cameron here. I'm in Cape Town. I was the only journalist in northern Nigeria. Not an adventure until you get lost in Tijuana. You get caught inside by a giant wave, you feel really alone. I love the adventure of waking up and not knowing what will happen and that being my job. I'm standing at a desert oasis right now. A lot of tourists don't see this part of Bali. Smiles and thumbs up. Thumbs up. Yeah, I, I would assume that when you pick something like an Outlaw Ocean series, you've been doing this for four years, you need to think at the beginning, am I going to be interested in talking about this for four years, maybe longer? I read on your Wikipedia that mm-hmm. this series is being optioned mm-hmm. for uh, a Leonardo DiCaprio Netflix mm-hmm. film, which seems like that would be a home run if mm-hmm. that happens. Is that happening? Yeah, yeah. So they so it was optioned... Um, by Knopf Doubleday for a book and I just finished that and it's coming out next year and then um, 
DiCaprio and Netflix option the movie rights and they um, uh, sent a screenwriter with me on, the, on a couple of the reporting trips. I took these last two years off and I uh, went back out to report and I took the screenwriter with me on a couple of trips and then and he wrote screenplay and it's sort of working its through its way through um, the Hollywood th- meat grinder, if you will. <laughs> right. you know, I, I don't quite understand the, the parts of that machine, but I, I do think it is a bit of a meat grinder, but it seems to be moving forward. As, right. As and know. you expand the audience out to uh, a really important topic that's difficult to engage people without the cinema. Yeah, that's so true. I do think like um, my personal view is that when it comes to the oceans, um, you know, there, there is really amazing advocacy happening out there and there's really great academic work happening out there, whether it's um, often on pretty dry stuff, you know, plastic pollution or coral reefs or whale, you know, obliteration or whatever, um, acidification. Um, but what is lacking is... Um, sort of narrative, you know, ch- ch- um, converting this into stories that will grab the hearts and minds of the public, of the average public, and thus of also of decision makers. I feel like that translation occurs in a lot of other spaces and a lot of other topics, and it's less and less occurring now with the oceans, partially because of the economics of journalism. Um, uh, newspapers are pulling back. You know, Three decades ago, there used to be maritime reporters at most major papers, and now there are none. Um, and so you have less investment in this very expensive type of reporting. And then you also have the nature of the, the internet news cycle making attention spans shorter and you know uh, editors wanting everything clippy. Um, and that doesn't really work for this space. Um, uh, and so I feel like you have increasing urgency of, of what's happening out there on one hand and decreasing a, awareness uh, on the other hand. Right. And is it a big win for your editor if the Outlaw Ocean gets optioned into mm. a film? Because they're, they're placing a bet on mm-hmm. you. I uh, listened to a podcast that you did with someone else where you said you, you pitched the story uh, to your editor as kind of like an off the hip, like, hey, maybe I'll do this. And they're like, okay, great. And that then became this whole gargantuan project. Yeah. But it is a bet that they're placing on you that you're going to deliver a story Something at good, the end yeah. of this. And then like, does the New York Times benefit from it being turned into a film? I think so. Yeah, I think um, it, it takes their brand out further, right? And it associates them with things that are outside of their playing field. Um, if the movie's terrible, it's not great, you know, but it's not really a big knock on the Times because it doesn't say a movie produced by the Times. It'll say based on the Times. Um, so, yeah, I, I do think um, the success of any line of reporting it, it reflects on the institution. Right. Yeah, I'm thinking about the movie Spotlight and mm-hmm. what that did for the Washington Post. Mm-hmm. I, The way that I think about the Washington Post changed after I saw that film. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, and I think, I mean, the one thing I was really um, sort of a pain in the ass about with this optioning was um, initial, initially there was a lot of interest to do the um, intrepid journalist story, you know, and um, some of the initial bids on the project were saying that that's the direction they wanted to go, and I was not really interested in seeing that happen. Coming 2019. Yeah. Exactly. Action Ian Euro. Urbina, yeah, played that, yeah. by Leonardo DiCaprio. I couldn't live up to that, <laughs> first of all. Uh, it's just anyone who knows uh, yeah, me. You got like a Tom Hanks look. <laughs> I had, we've had Tom Hanks I, as a Mariner I, before. <laughs> so, uh, and I also just think it's a disservice to like the issues, you right. know, like to make it about the... What if they turned you into like a Jack Bauer character? <laughs> like, tell me where they are! <laughs> Tell me where the slaves I, are. I could never look at my colleagues again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're like, it's got a soft-spoken right, exactly. investigative journalist. Yeah, yeah, you yeah, on yeah. The, you're like, I became a writer to stay away from <laughs> exactly, this shit. Exactly. Yeah, so so the deal was, uh, you know, if you're going to do a movie, make it about the issues right. that, that are covered there, not about the reporter. Um, right. It was fine. That's great. And um, so you have been traveling to Southeast Asia. Um, one of the most interesting aspects of the story that I, I found was this um, kind of indebted servitude mm-hmm. uh, issue that happens with people who will go out. Um, these are people who, who will go into Thailand 
um, mostly immigrants. They'll have a big night at a karaoke bar. Mm-hmm. Um, they'll run up a big tab, and then the bar manager will say, well, now you're indebted to this ship, so you're going to have to go out and um, and be a fisherman to pay off this debt. And then give, because of the reporting that you've done, um, you found that a lot of these guys, you know, they were as young as 14 years old and they hadn't been off the ship for over a year. Um, but I wanted to start off by talking about that dynamic mm-hmm. in the karaoke bars mm-hmm. and how that works. Yeah, so if you think of the map, just to start with the basics, um, you know, you have Thailand, which is a relatively middle, upper middle class country with less than 2% unemployment. And so the, the worst jobs in society are um, uh, taken by migrants. Uh, and Thailand is surrounded by um, countries that are you know, deeply poor and, and usually war ravaged. So Laos, Cambodia. Um, uh, and so um, migrants come across to find jobs they're usually into Thailand. They're usually brought in by a labor broker who um, says for the guys, hey, you're going to work in construction. And for the women, hey, you're going to be a domestic, meaning a house nanny. Um, They're not actually destined for that. Um, The women are usually trafficked into the sex industry and then the men are trafficked to the fishing boats. But on the inbound, they pick up some serious debt just with the traffickers because these guys are coming from small villages. They have no money to their name. They get in and the trip is usually long and there are lots of stops along the way. And Those stops are often in karaoke bars, which are essentially brothels, and they keep the guys upstairs. And just as you said, the debt, you know, kind of um, compounds by carousing at these bars. And, you know, the guys are small town, small village, average folk, some of them quite young. They have no clue. They don't even speak the language, typically, of where they are. And um, so they think that carousing is just sort of part of the trip or whatever. Maybe she really liked me or whatever. And uh, next thing they know, the debt they thought they started out with is, you know, times five. And it's because of all the carousing. And, um, you know, the closer you get to the ports, the scarier it gets for these groups. Um, Usually it takes two to three weeks before they get to the port. And, um, you know, things get more locked down. There are more guys with guns. There's more roughing people up and more threats. And by the time you get the port and you realize there's no way we're getting a construction job, you know, um, you've been told, just as you said, the spiel that is, uh, hey, you've got a serious debt on your hands. And so you'll be working on this boat for at least a year, year and a half to uh, pay that back. And even that is a ruse because once you leave port, it's not like there's bookkeeping. Like, oh, you, you know, you chipped away at your debt today. It's you stay on that boat until the captain decides to let you go and what do these boats look like so most in the, in the Thai fishing fleet them um, over 60 percent are trawlers uh, and that's a certain type of fish that drags the net behind them um, they're typically wooden they're typically you know 50 feet long um, really old um, part of Thailand's problem is um, in the last four decades where a lot of other countries have modernized their fleets and automated a lot of things, Thailand has sort of hunkered down in this old, somewhat ridiculous um, makeshift fleet because they have all this cheap labor flowing into their country. And so they're like, why would I automate when I can get 10 guys to do that work um, for virtually nothing? And so they have a bloated fleet. And then they're just horrific. Um, you know, So a photographer and I went out and our goal was to get on these boats and spend time there and um, that was a process, but um, what you quickly realize is the threats on the boats are not just the bosuns or the sort of discipline keepers. It's also just the hygienic conditions are rat infested and roach infested, and and they're industrial work zones. So like, if you imagine being on an elevator that's constantly going up and down, and the floor of the elevator is you know skating rink slippery, and uh, um, and then you throw it and you make that elevator, you know, a good, you know, 25, 25 feet by 25 feet space. Um, and then you have like massive spinning industrial machines, you know, whirling 24 seven, you know, cause they run shifts, except for if they're going to a different fishing ground, they're, they're running some sort of shift at all times. Uh, and you've got sharp tackle and nets and all this stuff like laying around. And that's what the deck looks like and so um a lot of these guys have never been off land you know they're coming from little villages where they've and so getting your sea legs in those conditions not getting seasick not getting infections um not falling overboard um you start to see how 
um, some of the statistics make sense about how many people die on these boats. Um, and do they fillet the fish on board? Is that one of the jobs? No, so the fish um, usually are prepped a little bit, so maybe deheaded and stuff like that, but uh, mostly they're put in these big blue plastic um, drums that are oddly sort of standard on, across all these boats, and every boat has, you know, 50 of them, and they are for the ice, uh, icing down the fish, and they keep them all below deck, and they keep the ice all down there. And these are not, you know, again, modern, most modern, even Taiwanese vessels, um, have freezers, you know, proper, you know, electrified freezers. This is all, you know, kind of ice blocks, um, and it's all in these. So they put, they catch the fish, they sort them. That's when you can get in real trouble with the captain if you screw up on the sorting. Uh, and then they put them on ice, and then they put them below board. And the worst job on the ship is usually um, working in the in the freezer in the ice room because um, uh, it's just brutally cold. I'm sure. And it's tuna. What other kind of fish are so on board? The, so these ships, the the near the, the ships I'm describing are not usually tuna. Okay. These are often forage fish. These are um, the kind of what's often called trash fish, and so they're much smaller fish. You get your kind of um, catching by weight, you know, um, and a lot of that fish is ground up either for our supplements, you know, our um, omega. I'm blanking. Omega omega three, threes, yeah. You know, omega um, three fish oils. Yeah. Out. This is called the reduction industry, and so a lot of this fish isn't really big enough or the proper taste for human consumption, so it ends up either reduced into um, uh, pelletized protein, uh, fish meal it's called, that gets fed to salmon that ends up on your restaurant plate, or chickens and pigs to beef them up, or it gets reduced down into omega-3 right. and made into your supplement. Cat food? Um, so the cat food, so I was on the boat where they were making chunk, they were, a part of their production was chunked high-end pet food and they would uh, use some of this for like the really schnazzy you know expensive pet food Whew, yeah, holy yeah, shit yeah. and to be clear these motherships don't go back to port the ice is brought out the fish are taken back to port but that's how you get these stories of people who are slaves at sea and they haven't been off the boat for over years. a year or so. Yeah, yeah. So, so the mother, there are two categories. They're the fishing ships, right? These are, I was on a couple of purse signers, which is one type of netting ship, but most of them are trawlers. Those are the fishing boats. The mother ships are the supply vessels, like the moving Walmarts that go from shore to boat and then back to shore. And like you said, the mother ships bring men, parts, drugs, food, ice, out, a fuel, and then fish back. Um, and if the guy's sick or whatever, sometimes they bring them back, but usually they don't. If they need extra guys, they bring them out. Okay. So the motherships are doing the transport. And where, which companies uh, are this fish sold to? You mentioned yeah. Omega 3s and Pelletize, everyone. everyone. Yeah. yeah, I mean, um, it, you know, Thailand is a major, is the largest importer of fish to the U.S. Um, uh, a lot of it gets routed through circuitous um, paths because it gets canned in one place and repackaged in another. Um, yeah, but, it's fish. Uh, it would be impossible yeah. to tell where it came from. Especially the reduction industry because it's all clumped together and, and, you know, kind of parsed out in weird ways. But, but yeah, it, it's, it's, it's global. I mean, the biggest consumers of fish are, as you'd expect, Asia is number one, the European Union number two, and the U.S. number three. Holy yeah. shit. Yeah. Yeah. So... Uh, like, what do we do about this? <laughs> yeah, that is the perennial and legitimate question that I struggle with. Um, so, so let me step back from the question for a second. So the Owl Ocean series was really a look at the diversity of bad stuff happening out there. And so it was attempting to correct a public understanding, which has, in my view, always... Um, when I would tell people I'm working on maritime crime, they'd say, oh, like Somali piracy and the BP spill. And I'd say, yes, but um, there's a whole lot more stuff that happens out there that most people are not aware of. And so the series touched on, you know, organized thievery paid for by banks, you know, repo men at sea and, and gun running at sea and human slavery at sea and intentional dumping of oil, not spills at sea and, um, and overfishing and illegal fishing and so killing of stowaways. So there's a real kind of... S taxonomy of of crime that we were aiming at so um the answers of well how do you deal with the problem of 
pe captains killing stowaways um, is obviously going to be very different than how do you deal with the problem of cruise ships that are dumping intentionally dumping more oil in the ocean than the Exxon Valdez every year, you know. Um, so the solutions will vary. But on the issue of humans on sea slavery, which is the one you asked about, um, there are a couple of things. One, there are some good organizations out there that um, are now trying to branch out their ranking system and so the monterey bay aquarium as you well know like you know has this um report card that it's run for a long time that sort of helps consumers of fish um figure out uh which is the most environmentally destructive and which isn't and they've in the last couple of years realized hey we need to think about the humans above the waterline not just the fish below the waterline so let's rejigger our rating system to try to take that into account and that's great you know that's um and so one thing a consumer can do is look at those types of websites. Greenpeace also has a good one. Oceana has a good one. Um, uh, the other thing to do is, um, you know, th there's a great guy named Paul Greenberg who is kind of a, a fish historian, and he writes sort of popular books, really well-researched, and he's got a book out that just came out about the Omega-3 um, sort of scam and the reduction industry and um, how it, really the research on whether that supplement does anything for you is um, uh, grim. You know, it, right. it doesn't look like it really does and the consequences of that industry. So I, would, I, would, I don't want to advocate, you know, specific solutions because I'm not supposed to, but I would say check out his writings sure. on that issue. Um, it'll make you rethink whether that supplement is something you should be involved with. Yeah, um, yeah. So just, you know, they're like very, there's no med, there's no silver sure. bullet, but there are lots of small steps that people can take to start the trying to. The theme that I see with all of your stories, though, is a lack of accountability. Mm -hmm. Lack of accountability and bad incentives. It's mm -hmm. bad incentives for the people who I like I don't think that the people who are in these karaoke bars who uh, get these migrant workers onto the ships are necessarily evil but they're a part of this incentive structure that makes them get these guys on for cheap labor and there's no repercussions for it um, the incentive to dump bad dump oil at sea is there because they want to do it it's cheaper for them and as you wrote about the incentive to kill stowaways on the ships is there because they will the ships will be fined massive amounts if they're caught with stowaways when they get back into port. Right. So it puts all these fishermen in a, a bind, a bind yeah. right? And how do we shift those incentives to change the structure? I mean... Yeah, I think you're right. exactly right. It's clear you did your homework. Um, I do think the other metaphor here is the problem of hidden costs. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you, you see the problem of hidden costs and show up in a lot of places. So, for example, you see our climate change, um, you know, um, as a problem of long having thought that the skies were a bottomless trash can where we could emit carbon and not really pay a price. And now we're paying the price. And the oceans, I think, are similarly a story of hidden costs in that um, we all, I think, informed consumers marvel at how is it possible I could get a can of tuna for $2.60 that probably was caught less than a month ago in Taiwan, you know, off the coast of South Africa and canned in Taiwan and got to this shelf and it's that cheap. Like, how does that work? It doesn't work. Um, it works because there's massive subsidies from the you know gov Chinese government to f bolster that boat and and um, there are all sorts of hidden costs that usually have life and death consequences like the labor on those boats didn't get paid or, you know, um, and that's part of the business model. So I, I do think, um, you know, if we're going to go meta here and think about the big picture, Let's do it. the uh, the um, the way to think about a lot of these problems is, um, like you said, uh, incentives, finding the solutions, thinking about the dollars and cents that go into the solutions, and being ready to pay the price for the that extra cost. Right. And if you want to go meta meta, there are extremists like me who believe that life in addition to economic value also has intrinsic value that should be accounted for. Right. And then there are people who believe that the market should determine whether or not planet Earth gets turned into a paved parking lot. Right. Right. And and again, you know, laying all options out there, not advocating, but, um, 
you know, uh, there are a good and growing number of people that um, think the solution is to stop eating meat and seafood. Um, and, and, and there is a logic to that. Um, uh, so I, I would be remiss if I didn't put that idea forward as well. Sure. Yeah, I uh, was checking on your Twitter. The tweet that you have pinned is a, a hunting story, right. which is um, so timely because a woman who I just had on the podcast is um, – a, uh, a wildlife toxicologist mm. named Mira Finkelstein mm. who reports on the toxicity of lead bullets in ammunition, um, specifically the impact that it has on condor population mm-hmm. because these lead bullets, um, you know, not only in, in big game, but in small game, um, like squirrels, for example, uh, will be they'll be eaten by the condor, and then high levels of lead will be found in their blood. So we, I had just learned about that, and then I went to your Twitter page, <laughs> and then it starts off, "I'm on a hunt in Oregon." That's right. And I was like, oh, "Okay, is this story going to be about a vegetarian and ethics of meat?" But you specifically went for lead in bullets, which yeah. I was really happy about. I feel like it went another level deeper uh in the hunting conversation normally the way that i've seen that one ping pong back and forth is that you shouldn't eat meat because it's unethical hunters say well we support conservation with our hunting dollars mm-hmm. and it's more ethical than you getting it from the supermarket mm-hmm, and then mm-hmm. the vegetarians are like yeah but you should <laughs> s- still not do- i still don't like it <laughs> but, but I you're having it, fun but you're right <laughs> but you're having fun while you do it yeah I'm, you should be over more yeah, exactly. i buy my sausage exactly we didn't like the, we didn't like the photo you posted <laughs> right now we want a more uh romanticized photo of you on a bluff with your mm-hmm. bow wait no so did you use a bow or a gun right <laughs> you didn't get the, the ping pong match That's continues right. i felt like yeah. this was like a forehand slam from the vegetarians <laughs> like but you use lead bullets Bam! I'm like ooh that was a good one but also I think a, an important point for uh, hunters to take in because I, I bow hunt mm-hmm. and have done so um, because I have eaten meat mm-hmm. and I wanted that experience and I do think that it is more ethical than going to Walmart and getting my meat um, but and I and most hunters I know really are conservationists Mm -hmm. um but i haven't heard them talk about the issue of lead bullets Mm -hmm. and i think that if that issue was adopted by hunters it could create some common ground um not only in the conservation space but also in the firearm space Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah no i mean i think um part of the goal so that story that you're mentioning was a second part to a primary story which was about the lead issue and the second story was about the experience as a reporter who tried who's a vegetarian doesn't know a whole lot about hunting and was trying to do a good job of representing this demographic and um uh but the the core story sought to um make the point that those who are pushing the anti lead ammo movement are hunters you know these are conservationist hunters and so what does that mean you know um and uh why are they pushing it and what kind of pushback do they get within their own community because you know everyone we were with were all avid hunters and and um uh so yeah it was it was i really enjoyed it it was really like I said, it was gastrointestinally um, taxing because <laughs> right. you know, I ate more meat in that week than I have in almost a decade. Um, and I did so partially just so that I didn't have to say I was a vegetarian with those folks because I thought that would alienate me even further as an outsider. Um, uh, but um, but just sort of watching the truly kind of spiritual um feeling that those folks had with the process of hunting and the knowledge they had of the space and um and the genuine i think um uh affection they had for the wildlife some of which they were killing you know like uh uh was riveting yeah 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 absolutely and you say you it was an elk hunt i've never done that i've i've hunted wild pig and ram Mm. but man that's a whole nother beast elk those, that's a large animal. It is a large animal, but but I found myself thinking a lot about bow hunters and sort of having a distant respect for them um, because so much of our time was spent trying to get close enough for a you know 
her, the, the person who had the permit was a woman named Chelsea Cassins, and she thought she could take an ethical shot at about 100 feet out, and so we need to get that close. And man, you know, these beasts are really adept, and they can smell or see or hear you from forever away. And Don't pick um, that twig. Yeah, it was just... <laughs> or if uh, the wind swirls. Yeah, it was screwed. just like, it was... And so I was thinking, well, so <laughs> if we were bow hunting, imagine how much tougher it would be, because you'd have to get that much closer, and the accuracy, I would think, is... I don't know. I don't know much about bow hunting, but it just seemed like it would be even harder. Yeah, I've never been so conscious of my footsteps. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, my friend uh, Justin Lee, he's a, a very good bow hunter, and he's been kind of my mentor in this. He taught me to walk with my feet flat, because huh. normally when we walk, we have that roll. It, the yeah. roll, and it kind yeah, of goes yeah, <laughs> with the gravel, so he taught me to walk with my feet flat. Huh. And uh, <laughs> it's a very meditative experience mm-hmm. in a fast-paced world when yeah. normally we're not yeah. thinking about that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so did you, uh, so I think it should be also known that th- they were hunting with, um, non-lead Correct. bullets, right? Yeah. which is an alternative. So you can use, is it copper? Yeah. So you can use copper. So it seems like this could be a relatively simple shift to make in the ammunition industry. It's a, it's a cultural, you know, it's, this is a community that doesn't like change. And, and if you've been shooting with one type of ammo your whole life, um, uh, you know, th- that's a hard transition to make just conceptually. And then there's all this ideology around, you know, is this, if I acquiesce on this issue, is this a slippery slope toward the greenies, you know, imposing more limitations on which type of guns we can use and that sort of stuff. So there is there is real pushback. And, and there's some folklore, misled folklore surrounding the copper bullets that, and I t- tried to touch on those in the piece about, you um, are they going to kill as quickly and effectively yeah. and, and are you being unethical in using them because if they if the animal dies slower and that seems um, baseless that concern yeah uh, the research yeah when, when I hunt I like to grind up rhino horn and put it in my bullets and then shoot <laughs> that it's the most right, effective dark. and accurate <laughs> said with tongue in cheek I will <laughs> note <laughs> in this day and but age. I do it to, to hunt wild boar which are overpopulated in Hawaii so, so right, I like use the rhino it's horn carbon offset and, yeah exactly. <laughs> it's, a, it's, like, it's like capping it's like right, cap right, and right, trade right, right, with exactly. rhino horn it's, like, it's an animal ethical cap and trade <laughs> exactly <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. Um, so how uh, how'd you get into investigative reporting, man? I, I, I think that it's um, you're a fantastic writer and it's also evident that you love adventure mm-hmm. and you love being out in the field and experiencing this stuff and um, gathering details that most people miss. Mm. Um, well, thank you. Um, I don't know if I agree, but uh, thank you. Um, I. I went to grad school out of undergrad, and I was in a um, doctoral program in anthropology and worked as an anthropologist for a while in that program. So I was at University of Chicago for five years doing that in Mexico and Cuba. And um, I really fell in love with, um, uh, A, the experience that that anthropology offers you the sort of parachutist you know you go to exotic places and as your life you know i think you can relate um you go to really neat places and you have an excuse to be there and figure out what they're like whoever that they are right. um uh i liked i moved out of the academy and out of anthropology per se because journalism emerged as something that if you did it well, I thought you would be doing the same thing, but faster, you know, and uh, sort of more caffeinated and also with more readers, you know, right. like um, than what I was producing in that room. And so it wouldn't it, just be peer reviewed by your yeah, ten colleagues in the back end of the library, in the library uh, yeah. or some journal. Um, and also there was a there was something that attracted to me, um, me to journalism in that there was a premium put on clarity rather than obfuscation. Um, you know, you if you couldn't say that in a way that a seventh grader could understand, then you were failing. That was your your fault. And so um, I thought that was a good ethic um, from a teaching perspective. And I just, I like traveling and I like um, trying to see things that are hiding in plain sight. And I like the sort of, again, I think you personally can relate to this. I like the the physical challenge of some of these trips, you know, your silly stuff, you know, how late can I stay? How hard can I drive myself before I get sick? You know, how much danger is stupid danger, you know, um, and not for its own sake, but just for the story. Yeah. Hopefully for the story. At least that's what I tell myself. Um, 
uh, that um, there is a higher good. And I, I also incline towards stories that um, are not sort of, uh, they're not merely travel stories. It's not entertainment. They, they have some ostensible social goal in them, um, you know, highlighting something that's broken and wrong and should be fixed. Like most of what I try to report on has that core requirement too. Whether I succeed in telling them in the right way or whatever, I don't know. That jury can decide. But, but those are my goals. Right. Yeah. I can tell. I can tell you um, are intensely tuned in to when people lose interest <laughs> at all times, <laughs> <laughs> which is good to have. I mean, it, people's attention is uh, it's a valuable thing That's to be able true. to have. Yeah. Um, and to think about your stories in terms of it being uh, a, the Outlaw Ocean series, a human story, not an environmental right, story, right, I think was right. a smart thing to mm -hmm, do. Mm -hmm. um, so when you were in Thailand, uh, how did you get out on these ships? Mm. It seems like they wouldn't just yeah. be like, hey, come yeah. check it out. <laughs> it's like a tour of yeah. Disneyland, except everyone's starving. Yeah. It, um, so I went to Thailand and... Uh, went with a guy, an amazing photographer, British guy, staff photographer for the Times named Adam Dean. And um, we had a couple of goals. One was we wanted to get out onto a certain subset of ships, which were thought to be the ones that had the most egregious conditions, like the, the, the worst stories. Um, and those were the ships that were not near coastal. These were the ones that were really, these are transshipment ones, the ones you talked about before, the ones that rely on motherships and they stay out there for obscenely long time, sometimes a couple of years. We wanted to get out onto those ships. And um, uh, we also wanted to get on them and not report on land, taking stories of deckhands when they got back to shore. Because we thought, you know, there's something to be said for firsthand eyeball journalism, you know, and, um, but those ships are usually like 150, 200 miles out at least. Sometimes they're as far away as Somalia, you know, and so figuring out how to get out there was going to be a logistical challenge. Then there was a political sensitivity because when we arrived there, um, the Guardian had maybe six, nine months before we got there, done some really good, impressive reporting along the same lines. This is not a new topic. You know, Environmental Justice Foundation, Human Rights Watch, U.S. State Department had been putting out reports of this sort for a while, and so had the Independent of London. And so when we got there, um, uh, AP was on the ground when we were there, and we were there, And but we were all in the wake of the Guardian. Associate and producer? Uh, Associated Press. Associated AP. Press, yeah. Okay. Um, I come and from film background, so <laughs> where's exactly. the AP? Wrong medium. Um, and uh, so, um, and the State Department has this little division in the U.S. State Department called the TIP office, which is the Trafficking in Persons office, and they specialize on trafficking issues globally. And they put out this report every year, the TIP report, that ranks countries one, two, or three. And three is really bad news for you. There are trade repercussions and, and means you've got a real problem. And Thailand had just been bumped from one to two right before we got there. So an EJF and had put out a report. So there was all these reasons that people were on edge, especially at ports. So two guy, two white guys show up um, asking about these sorts of issues, and it's really not going to get you very far. So we first had to figure out which place in Thailand to choose, um, ideally a place where we could be somewhat discreet, but also there was a really well-established problem of these sorts of boats and this sort of trafficking pipeline. And we chose a place called Songkla, Thailand, and we set up camp there. We had a translator, Adam and I, and we were going to hopscotch. We figured out pretty quickly that the only way we could get out 200 to those boats was if we found boats that would take us like in 50-mile intervals and then put us on another boat. So we were going to hopscotch our way out there. And the first hop in the whole process was going to be the toughest um, because you were dealing with captains who knew the New York Times, knew about the press, knew the consequences of the State Department ranking, like we're aware of these issues and sensitive to them and they wanted nothing to do with these guys, you know, us too. Um, so we essentially just spent nights going out and drinking with captains and trying to convince them to take us. And there's no 
kind of hustle you can do in that situation. A, you're not allowed to, and B, it's not going to work. These guys are really pretty savvy, and you're also working through a foreign language anyway. Um, so we just had to be really plain with them. And usually the thing that would convince them is we will, we're we using you as transport. We're not going to report on you. So if you could just take us out and get us on another boat, we can guarantee we're not reporting anything on your boat. Right. But when you say you're not allowed to hustle, do you mean you're not allowed to lie to them right. about who you are? Who we are. Right. Right. The Times has you know, pretty strict rules on at the time the very paper to paper, but the Times you can never lie about what you are. You can't right. say I'm a cop or a uh, anthropologist. You have to say I'm a journalist if asked. But you don't have to unsolicited offer that information. Right. Um, but you know, you're but in if they ask you, you can't be like, I'm an incredible ping pong player. Right. <laughs> yeah. I'm just I mean, a guy. I also am that, right. but yeah, exactly. <laughs> I also happen to work for the New yeah. York times. <laughs> no, you, and, and, but th- we couldn't even get meetings with these guys unless they knew who we were. And, and, um, but in any case, it took a couple of days and we finally got, you know, a guy who was willing to take us the first leg. And then we went twice on the second time. Can you pay them? Yeah. So you can pay uh, for transport, you can never pay someone who will be a source. So the minute we hand money over to those captains, we can't then quote them or use anecdotes from them or anything like that because they're transport. So that's fine because we'd already guaranteed these guys. So in some ways, part of what we were doing when we would drink with these guys is we would lay out all these rules. Like you realize here's how our profession works and here's what we, and here's how much we'd pay and here's all you will do. And, you know, and so, you know, eventually we got um, guys... And what was interesting is the guy that took us out was like, um, fine, well, I'll take you out 50 and I'll get you on another boat, but you have to take another boat out six because I don't want to be seen in port with you guys getting on my boat because the word will get around that I'm like facilitating whatever it is you guys are about to produce. So it was just like really intense, you know, phobia of us. But long story short, we got a little dinghy out to seven miles, got on the yeah. boat, took us out 50. And, and you want to be careful with those guys because after you're long gone, then someone finds out about that guy and kills him. Right. Like exactly. those are the people. You have to be super respectful. Of that. Yeah, yeah, that are put in legitimate danger. Yeah, yeah. Even the ones who are up, who are doing things that you don't agree with, um, you can't. You, you have the. You have to exactly as you say. You have to be really, really attentive to just what's at stake for people. Not to mention on your own staff, like the translator we had with us. You know, was a female, and she lives in this area, and she would have to come back again, and she was the one who would be most at risk. Yeah. Um, so you got out, that's, that's crazy, Mm. man. Yeah. So you got out there on those boats and when you're out there, how are you taking details for the story? Do you have a notebook? Like what did you say that you enjoy taking in what other people are missing? And, um, you also said that you wanted this to be a story that you really brought the readers out Mm -hmm. there. How are you making sure that you're not missing the details Mm -hmm. in this whirlwind? So we didn't know where we were headed in this hopscotch and we didn't also know when we should stop hopping right Right. until we rolled up on the ship which was like 20 feet away when we got there and all the deckhands came out to the edge and there's a really famous photo that we always call the lost boys shot which um is just this epic shot of all these guys standing on the edge of the ship and that's the ship that we embedded on longest and we stayed with them and when we approached i said to adam this is it like immediately you saw it you're like whoa you know these guys look so haggard and there was like you know, guys who look like they're in their 20s and guys who look like they might be 12. And there were 40 of them. They were all Cambodian, you could tell. And it, they just looked haggard. The boat looked barely seaworthy. And I just knew, like, this is our boat. And so um, I desperately wanted on that boat. And our captain on our transport at that stage had the job of negotiating us onto that boat. And um, we had no certainty as to how we were going to get back. Um, but we just wanted on. And you know, this whole long conversation happened between them. Um, and eventually they brought us on. And then I was like telling the transport to hurry up and get away because I didn't want them to get cold feet. And then, right. So we stayed on that boat for a couple of days and, um, stayed up most of the time. And, uh, I, um, I have a very, very weak long-term memory, but a really intense short-term memory, probably because of this job. And I don't know why, but, um, I can keep things in my head down to the quote for a good 24, 48 hours. 
so I usually would just be out circulating. And then if someone said something that's just like amazing, I would quickly duck out and scribble some enough that would bring it back. But I, I don't normally record um, because of things you can intuit. It makes people nervous and it's too much gadgetry to have. And, um, and uh, they start seeing you like a reporter. And yeah, up. exactly. Yeah, and I just want to talk with them. And, and um, it's major, man. The uh, the set the set and setting of how you ask questions mm-hmm. is so crucial that's why i love this setup it's like it's a s- couple yeah. small beat up mics yeah. and it feels like a true conversation a little conversation yeah, yeah, yeah but the the bigger the cameras the more people clam up yeah it, the worst interviews i've ever done with people were when we had a film crew of five people yeah. and a lighting guy and a camera yeah. and all of a sudden people get self-conscious yeah. and like, your translator in this case is super crucial and this is why um, we had this female translator and she was super sick at this point. She'd gotten food poisoning and she was also seasick, uh, but she was tough as nails and sort of gutting it out. She'd throw up and then she'd translate some and throw up. And um, she was young, female, pretty, and charismatic and like really smart. And she, I could never have pulled this off were she not there doing that because I think a lot of those young guys relaxed around her and were so happy to be around a female and is it only guys on the ship oh yeah yeah holy yeah, shit it's world. Yeah. so it's the first woman that they've seen, seen in a long really, time yeah um how did you initially get on that ship you said there was a long conversation mm-hmm. that went down but how did they what was said yeah that? what was said um what, i don't like, know what 100%. did these... I, I had to tell certain rules like the minute I knew that was going to be a reporting ship, you know, re, uh, a sort of you're going to be a reporting. subject yeah. as opposed to and a source as opposed to transport, I needed to tell my negotiator that the case, you know, that um, we couldn't pay that next one. So when we approached, I, I turned to Adam, the photographer, and said, um, "Yeah, this is it. We want to stay on this one." Um, and so uh, the translator went to our captain of the transport ship and said when you get us on there, you can't tell them we're going to pay them because we can't pay them. And so he's like, you know, I roll and it's going to be really tough to get you on at all without any money. And, and we kind of just got lucky. And the only term that was put on us, we found out as we were climbing across was the captain said, you couldn't identify the actual specifics of the ship. You could photograph or whatever you want, but just not its IMO numbers. It's license plate essentially. And we couldn't identify, we couldn't photograph or identify him. We did photograph him, but we didn't publish him. Um, but those were the two terms. And then the other ter- the other rules he imposed on us were whatever I say for you to do, you do. And then you, you got to stay away from the dog. There was this really mean, mean dog and he that was the big hang up as to whether the dog was going to attack us and so we constantly were having to move whatever floor he was on we had to get on a different floor. holy shit yeah and he was no joke yeah. whoa it's like a rottweiler kind of who had just had puppies and was just like an ornery beast whoa and uh do you need uh releases from the people that you photograph on the ship no because you know these are mostly it's, illiterate you know it's just in in my world you don't get releases right uh, um yeah, it's, it's just a like twelve-year-old kid who's been. Do, did you have to identify that you were doing a story about slavery at sea? No, no. Um, you just say and we would never use those terms anyway right. um, in that context. But I said I'm a journalist and I'm writing about um, conditions and life on these ships and who are the people that do this work and how do they end up here? Right. And that's as far as I go. I would never, you know, uh, I wouldn't say well, yeah. slavery because right. I mean. And that's not inaccurate. You know, I wanted to, I, I did think that there was slavery there, but there's a lot more than there than that there. And Yeah. As uh, you said, the, your job is, um, as a journalist, is to be clear and precise about what's happening and not make some overarching claim that is untrue. Right. Um, and I think that that's how you can change stuff. A big mistake that people make when they're trying to be advocates a lot of times is they overstep their bounds they overreach and then the whole issue loses credibility Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so yeah no and people also i think listeners or readers like appreciate the respect that you give them uh, to their intelligence when you lay out the contradictions and complexities and nuances you know if it's too black and white people are you know kind of yeah they they can smell it you're not right Man, what an experience mm. to then be on this this ship. Did you have mm-hmm. sleeping pads or how? Yeah, so the, the sleeping, sleeping was rate? funny. Uh, you know, so we were amped and we had been up already 
you know, good 30, 40 hours at that point when we got on there. And so we were, and the translator was in really bad shape. And so Adam, who's a big guy, and I had to um, kind of keep her with us at all times. So we were kind of carrying this cadaver around, which made things really difficult. And night fell, we hit some somewhat, you know, bumpy water. And, you know, there was a lot going on on the ship at night because that's when some intense fishing happens. Um, so, uh, you know, we kind of grinded it out for another 20 hours and then we were just like feeling unsafe, so tired. And also there was a strange lull. There were 40 guys on that ship um, and uh, um, we could only see like five or six. And we're like, where is that one? So we sort of ventured to the back of the ship um, and there was this weird i always describe it as like the scene in one of those alien movies when you, you discover the nest you know like they're always right. like like oh there's the pulsating mother bug or whatever this is what we came across which is this room in the back of the ship that was an uh, it was a dead end room right so it didn't go all the way through it was a half room meaning from floor to ceiling it was only about four feet high right so it was you couldn't stand up in it you had to crawl in there it was a crawl space room maybe five feet max so you could sort of squat down these are little people cambodians but um but even for them it was tight quarters and um and then it looked like the nest den because um the ceiling was covered in these cocoon like their fishing nets converted into hammocks and all the boys were in there. And what immediately took me was why are they bothering with hammocks when they're only about 12 inches off the floor? Why not just lay on the floor? Anyway, I, it was a passing thought. I made some snide remark to Adam and, and we just didn't think much of it. And it smelled God awful, like, because it's all their bodies and in a condensed space and there's not flowing air and, but we thought, okay, well, this is where they're sleeping, so this is where we should sleep. So we put the translator between us, and we all sort of laid beneath these guys like cadavers. You couldn't turn on your side, so you're on your back, kind of like in a coffin underneath them. And their ass is, you know, f right above your head, and they're dripping on you, and you don't care. We were so tired. We were just, like, so happy to be laying down. And we were all, like, right next to each other. We had headlamps on, and I think it took me six seconds to fall asleep. Um, and then the next thing I know is this flush of adrenaline comes over me and it's that alarm adrenaline that says something is not right and i don't know how long that was maybe it was a couple minutes or 15 minutes i don't know but i woke up and i immediately knew something was wrong and i sat up and i hit the guy above me knocked off my headlamp reached for it put it back on turned it on and looked around sort of still laying on my back but my head you know craned and the place was uh, like alive with rats it was like rats everywhere and rats had run across my legs and that's why I'd woken up and they were everywhere. It was like probably one of the most like insane things I've ever seen. And I suddenly realized that's why they sleep in those hammocks because is that the door? Um, Keep going because, this because, story, man. <laughs> I don't give a shit. <laughs> because they, for some reason there's like this detente between the rats and them and they don't mess with them in the hammocks, but they, Hello. but they come in. Hola, que tal? Como? Oh my god. No, estoy bien. Gracias. It, it's um. the room cleaner. Dude, <laughs> sorry, sorry. what an inopportune time for the, for the room cleaner to come in. Just, everyone's on the edge of their commercial seats. break. Jesus yeah. Christ. So there are rats everywhere, right? The room cleaner comes in. Um, oh my god. Uh, no, so so I look around and they're there it's like that's I don't know if Ben the movie Ben is one you remember with the they're they're rats along the the easel the wraps running in and out of the bags the, they're not particularly hygienic so all the bowls with hat, with food and rice on the floor the rats are cleaning them dry the rats are everywhere but they're not messing with them but they're running across us they ran across Adam they run across me and so I'm like we gotta get out of here we're gonna get bitten by a rat and we're gonna get like something terrible you know bubonic plague or something and, and I also just am afraid of rats um, <laughs> And there are a lot of them. Um, so I quickly, you know, wake Adam up gently so that he doesn't sit up and make my mistake and say, hey, we got to get out of here. And we sort of scurry out. We scoot ourselves out. And then we tried to take some pictures because it was so incredible, but the lighting was all off. And they were still running all between our feet and everywhere. And uh, then we just climbed to the very highest point outside the captain's uh, quarters and sort of sat on some of those barrels that I set and slept you know, for three hours, kind of in a huddled position where we knew the rats couldn't get us. Um, but, you know, the first thing I remember thinking is, 
buy a hammock you know like if, if i'm gonna do more of the supporting i need to have a hammock from now on because you don't lay on the floor on these ships oh so. man I'm really happy i asked you where you slept <laughs> exactly i got all my shots before and then again after I that trip i can see it now <laughs> leonardo dicaprio laying on the floor as ian orbina the rat climbs on his chest <laughs> like, ah, like screaming get like, off a, like, me. A, like a child <laughs> Oh, yeah. man. So yeah. you stayed on the ship, you reported on it, and then you went back yeah. to port after a few days. Yeah, right. So they took us back and sort of ushered us to another ship, and we got back to shore. Were the people, were the Cambodians on the ship aware of the conditions they were in? Were they aware of how wrong this situation mm-hmm. was? Or did they just kind of think that this was the, the norm this was the norm so it's a really good question um at, and i would break it down into conditions so there's the conditions when it comes to the economics of it like debt bondage um you know is it fair is it ethical is it the norm to be working off a debt that you probably shouldn't have accrued in the first place and most places in the world would say that's illegal um, because that's how you entrap people and also you're not even keeping books and I've been out here long past what would be the do that's messed up does that thought go through their head their head I think somewhat like um, so when I could get um, on these ships there's typically a bosun and the bosun so there are these officer crew and the officers are usually four or five of them and they tend to be Thai and then the deckhands are all the workers and they tend to be Loatian or Burmese or, or Cambodian and then there's a bosun and the bosun is usually the guy you got to be afraid of because usually the bosun is of the ethnicity of the crew so speaks their language but has been long enough with the ship that he's actually working for the officers and he knows what's being said he ex- he does all the interfacing with labor brokers he does the disciplining he does the killing if that ha- happens which it does happen on ships um and the the bosun is also when inspectors come unfortunately the one guy who's got the linguistic ability to bridge the gap so it's often who the s- stupid and ins- you know a bad inspection regime which for a long time has been the case in time they usually use the bosun as their translator terrible idea because the bosun's going to give you a complete misconception of what's going on on the ship um so when I could get the guys, and I knew this going in, the structure of, so I immediately had to figure out who's the bosun. That was pretty clear. He was the guy who was scowling at us and them, and, and they would shoot furtive glances up there when we would talk to them to see if the bosun was watching them. So when I could get away from them, away from the bosun, and get them to open up a little bit, they would talk about how long they'd been on there and sort of sorrowful sense of entrapment, you know, that they... They didn't expect to be here this long, and they don't even know if they've made any money yet and that kind of stuff. The hygienic conditions are different, like, is that pretty standard on these ships? And so the rats and all that stuff is kind of like a shrug, like, yeah, this is what it's like, you know. Um, The fear of death, either in the form of infection, very common, and sickness. They have amphetamines, like I saw, you know, bowls full of amphetamines on these ships, but no medicine, right? So if you get an infection, I had to stop, you know, I stopped wearing contact lenses because I couldn't put them, I stopped chewing my nails. Like I had to stop real because it's so dirty. And these guys... And wet, always wet. wet. Right, and their hands are all like chafed and they have these winches that are like this big around and you're you're managing the nets. As a surfer, I know that, man. I get a little cut on my foot. And if I'm in the tropics after three days, it's cratered out right. and it becomes an infection right. that you have it's to deal with for the next couple months. Yeah. yeah. And these guys, again, testament to the sort of problem of the Thai fleet in particular, they don't even automate their purse signers. So they put the boys in the water. So it's middle of the night in the middle of the ocean, pretty serious swells. You can't see anything. It's just pitch black out there. And you got six or seven guys in the water around these nets. And the nets are, they can be, you know, 500 feet around. And if a boy got pulled under or caught on something, whatever, you wouldn't know. It's so loud. They chant to pull the nets in synchronicity. So it's super dangerous and super wet, as you said. Um, but the hygienic conditions, no, the fear of discipline from the bosun and fear of death from infection or discipline from the bosun um, does feel like something that they're pretty aware of and scared of and feel is not right. Uh, they came from small villages where you don't treat people that way, but beatings are regular. Um, 
So it's a mixed bag as to their awareness of what we would call the crimes that exist there. Man, it reminds me of the Stanford prison experiments. Tell me. I'm you know, so it's the, it was the experiments that were done in the 60s where college students were brought in and they said, all right, you're the prisoners, right. you're the prison guards. Electri- uh-huh. And the electric shock, right. like, right. okay, now turn the voltage up. Right. And, and the student says, you know, oh, I, should I be doing should this? Should I be doing this? Yeah. 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 So it was, it was that. And it was also, yeah. it, it, that, that was the famous video right. of electrocuting right. um, another person. But there were other experiments um, that were done where uh, the, the, disciplining so so they were all Stanford students Mm -hmm. but some of them were given guard jobs some of them were prisoners and they said okay just act out your jobs and Mm -hmm. within a few days um, the guards were role playing role playing -playing a little too seriously until they had to shut the whole thing down but it's a great testament to how malleable we yeah. are as yeah. humans Not how in a quick- positive way yeah how, yeah how quickly we can shift into these roles and when you're talking about the bosun the the cambodian who was one of these guys but then shifts into yeah. a role of authority how grim the situation can get very quickly and i i tried to um i tried really hard to lean into an explanation from captains about the brutality, you know, and so after and before we went on that trip, um, I went out with a fair number of bosuns, ex bosuns, and captains, and said, you know, look, I'm not going to quote you by name, but talk to me about the statistics I hear about the kind of abuse and physical violence that's doled out, and why that feels legitimate. Um, and what I heard time and again was mutiny, like. Um, you know, there are 40 of them and there are six of us and you're out there and you have no idea if they get the spirit to rise up, how brutal they will kill us. And so we have to exert this, um, you know, sort of overwhelming shock and all level of discipline early on so that they know that if we even get a whiff of something, insubordination, whatever, um, they know there'll be dire consequences. They didn't put it in those terms, but that's essentially what what they would say consistently. You know, whether that's a legitimate justification and how real that threat is or not, I, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, there there have been cases of pretty brutal mutiny, which which you can fully understand why. Yeah, you know? I would hope that I would be the right. one doing yeah, it if exactly. I was on one of those yeah. ships. Yeah. But yeah, the, I um, I love sitting at tables that I have no business being at. And going into these different situations where all of a sudden you're swept up in these radically different cultural norms. I think that's one of the, mm-hmm. one of the craziest feelings of being a storyteller mm-hmm. is all of a sudden you're, you're on an elk hunt or you're out here on one of these ships mm-hmm. and you, you very quickly are in another world. And there's, it's not just a different situation visually, but culturally the way people talk to each other or the way people treat each other and how normalized that becomes. And you, your job is to kind of stay as the, like stay in In character, in character as this observer who doesn't make the people feel judged, but is also taking in as many details as possible. Yeah. It's such a, um, just a, a, vast way to live yeah because so yeah. often people only stay um in their circles yeah and that becomes their world it's one of the reasons why i do admire photographers because um uh in some ways i think they have a much harder job than the writer because they have to get that much closer in to get the shot they can't f- call it in they can't fake it they can't rely on intermediaries they have to be the one that's like right up in the face of that whatever it is um so that's tougher than often writers it's easier in the sense that you don't actually have to say much to them and you'll have to like interact with them and pull stuff out of their brain you have to capture the the scene um as best you can visually um but either way you know harder and easier um it's a it's a great way to experience the world because of all the reasons you just cited you you go in you take pictures you capture it visually um you practice being invisible fully invisible um and then you leave um i do think all this type of work 
be it photographers or writers, um, has that very predictable, um, dangerous side effect, which is guilt of sort of misery porn and voyeurism and sort of um, the exploitative potential of going in there. And also hard judgment calls where you're, um, you're, you're complicit to some degree by being there and I don't know, I guess I'm not putting words to it, but uh, where, you, where you wonder whether uh, you should not just be bearing witness. You should actually be doing more than that because that's so egregiously wrong and you happen to be here seeing it happening and you need to put the pen down and actually like switch into advocate mode, you know. And this series confronted me with some situations like that where um, I still wonder if uh, I'm sullied by not having done more. You know, maybe, but you're also playing the long game here, right? That you're is trying to that tell a story response, in a way yeah. that no one else has in a thorough enough way that a uh, Hollywood film could pick it up, and the details are there. Because if the, if you hadn't reported in such a detail oriented way, an objective way on that story, then it couldn't have legs to be something right, bigger. Right. Because then you are just an advocate, and people. Right. I'm not sure if I can really trust you. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. You lose your pass. You yeah. Know? Yeah. No, that's right. But it's a legitimate question. I think worth asking at all times, and I don't think that answer always applies like um that's just my own personal i think other journalists would say it always applies if you're going to be a journalist you can never actually engage you know even if you're about to see someone murdered i don't know that i would agree with that you know and what is objective journalism truly like you can never forget the place that you grew up and the world that you're still seeing the, the way that you're still seeing the world right but that's great man Man, what a story. What yeah, a story. Yeah, um, so next for you, you, you've finished this series. The series is now being turned into a book, which is coming out next year, uh, which is called The Outlaw Ocean. And it's going to be made into a film as well. That's the plan. Yeah, that's right. The, the book. And so the series that ran in the paper is about 30% of what went in the book. And then the last two years... Uh, was about 70% of new reporting, and that was even better than the first two years. Just more, I went to all the places that I now realize I really needed to go, Somalia and both Poles and um, uh, Kenya and Brazil and, you know, just all over the place. If there is an elephant in the room, it is the oceans. Mm -hmm. Like how underreported that part of the world is, and yet it's two-thirds of the world it's kind of crazy to think about. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and you, um, uh, we didn't plan this actually, but it's a perfect segue for, I mean, my ambition is, um, to keep this going because for the reason you just cited that, um, I do think, um, there are amazing stories that I could produce right now and others can and should produce right now that aren't getting told from out there um and not all just marine some great marine stories but a lot of them human stories that are just really riveting compelling shocking uh wild and fun and dark and scary and inspiring you know all the above and so my hope is to sort of springboard the project into something more lasting and just kind of keep doing more of these but i gotta figure out how to do that you know that's Amazing, the, man. Well, hey, good work. Um, I will link to the Outlaw Ocean on my it. website, kyle.surf. Um, and people can get in touch with you on Twitter. What's your Twitter handle? At or, Ian underscore Urbina. Okay, yeah. is that the best place? Um, yeah, it's fine. Any, okay. Or e- email Urbina at NY Times. Anyway, okay. I Google me and I'm findable. So, Ian. But thank you so much for having me. I thank you. It. All right. That's our show. I'm going to play you out with a song called Me and Baby Brother by Light the Band. Light the Band is a Santa Cruz-based band, and I went to high school with the bass player. I will link to their site in the show notes below. Also, if you like this episode and you want more like it, I recommend listening to 139 with Matt Taibbi. Here's a quick clip from that conversation. Financial power has, has been concentrated in a way that is unique in history. Like, really, only a few companies now control virtually um, all of the capital in in the world. Uh, In the United States, 
It's a it's four or five banks that that, that control the bulk of all the deposits, and they have an an immense amount of power to move markets, to affect prices. We've we've seen the latest round of scandals. You know the ones that that I covered had to do with coordinated market manipulation. So you're talking about things like affecting the price of the dollar versus the franc or the the. the world interest rates they're able to just sort of mess with those things they go in they can go in and fundamentally monkey around with the dna of the world economy in in ways that people just have no clue about once again that was episode 139 with matt taibbi thank you again to mudwater and santa cruz medicinals for supporting this show you can check out all of their products in the link below or go to mudwtr.com and scmedicinals.com i'll see y'all soon don't forget to send me those voice memos it's as easy as clicking the voice memos app on your phone recording a minute of audio and emailing it to info at kyle.surf once again you are all somewhere right now I know that's a very profound thing to say. So give me some details about where you are. Send it in. I'd love to play it. With that, I will see you soon. We got Kai Lenny and Jeff Clark coming up in the episode after this. I just recorded that. Um, and it's a beautiful day. It's a beautiful time of year. Get out in the water, even though it's cold. I promise it will make your day better. Whatever body of water you are close to, whether that is the ocean, a lake, stream, or just a cold shower, hop in and feel it. Hop in and feel it. That's my slogan for life. Hop in and feel it. Now, my slogan is celebrating the companies that fuck Mother Earth the hardest, the Motherfucker Awards which will be out soon. Uh, Videos are being edited, and it will all be released mid-January. So look for that. With that, thanks everyone for listening. See you soon!